Well, amen. Well, I tell you what, that's really all we have to tell. Amen. It's the story of Jesus. If you got anything else to say, you might better check up. Because the only explanation for my life is the story of Jesus. The only explanation for why I'm here tonight is the story of Jesus. So amen. Thank you, sister. She was worried because somebody requested her to sing that song again. And she just sung it more recently. You know, and I said, hey, sister, sing it. You can sing that one next Sunday if you want to. Amen. Now, some of you uh, walked home today because you left your keys here. It's a Chevy, and it's an AutoZone little, uh, little card there. So if that's you, come see me. Otherwise, I'm going to start checking doors and, and see if the key fits. Because you know they had those contests. If you stick the key in and it works, you, it, the car's yours. So I'm just saying. So there you go. All right, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 15. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. We're going to finish out the chapter tonight, or at least that's my intentions. To get done, I covered seven verses in, um, this morning, and we only have, well, let's see, 12 more to go. But there's some, I, I tell you what, I love God's Word. The more I study it, the more I prepare in it. Uh, I'm just amazed at how the Holy Spirit speaks. You know, the Bible was always meant to be revealed. It was never really meant to be understood except for the revelation of the Holy Spirit. That's why in my mortal mind, just my regular old fleshly mind, there are times I read Scripture, and you know this is true because this has happened to you, I'm sure. I can read a verse of Scripture and it does not say anything Specifically, I mean, I know what it says. You know what I mean. Uh, but, but there are times that I read a verse and suddenly it jumps, leaps off the page into my heart and explodes into my mind. And the Holy Spirit says, that's your verse. I'm talking to you. That refers to you. And suddenly the Bible is alive. That's why the Bible, the Word of God says it's quick. It's alive. It's active. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Nothing cuts me any quicker than the Word of God except maybe my wife when she's trying to tell me something. And she knows she's right. So anyway, we'll move on. Now, the, this morning, we talked about 2 Chronicles chapter 15, and we finished with a word of, of encouragement, a reassurance of the future when God said to Asa, he told him about their past, but he said, as for you, be strong, do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. And in essence, what he was saying to him is the work you have begun that we studied over the last couple of weeks in chapter 14, when it said that Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, he removed the foreign altars and the high places. We talked about that. And he said, basically saying to him, don't give up that work. Finish what you started. Keep on, go all the way. Don't hold back from the work that you've begun. Continue on. There have been times in my life when God has begun to deal with me about myself. 99.9% .9 of the time when God is dealing with me, it's about me. As far as I know, God's never dealt with me about you, that I should go help you fix something. He's always dealt with me to fix me. I think the Bible's pretty clear. Get the plank out of your eye, and then you might can find that speck in that other person's eye, but deal with your own two by four first. And so that's what God deals with here. And what he's saying is, continue on. Now, in verse 8, he begins, and we're just going to go verse by verse to finish out the chapter and just share some things God put on my heart tonight. In verse 8, he says, When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded the prophet, he took courage. He took courage. I like, it. I like what it said there. When Asa heard these words, there have been times men and women of God have spoken into my life and I didn't want to hear it. There have been times the Word of God, many, many times the Word of God has begun to deal with me and spoken into my heart and my life and I didn't want to hear it. But I like it here. It says that he heard these words, the prophecy. He listened. He heard it. He took it in and he, he gained courage from it. And he continued the work. Now, 
he could have gotten arrogant and said, hey, listen, I started this. I believe I know what I'm doing. Obviously, look at what I've done so far. Look at what God has blessed so far. Obviously, I'm on the right track. He didn't do that. When the prophet spoke to him and gave him a word from God, he took courage. He received it, and he took courage. We have an option every time we hear a word from God. Every time God's word speaks into our lives, when we're reading it or when someone is preaching it, we have an option. We can accept it or reject it. You have no other option. You cannot be indifferent to it. Indifference to the word of God is rejecting it. When, when God begins to speak to your heart and he takes a passage of scripture and when you read it, the Holy Spirit of God pierces your heart and convicts you and says, that's you. I'm talking to you. That verse is yours. This is your life. You, you only have one option or two options rather. It is accept it and deal with it or disobey it. There, there is, once you see truth, you cannot unsee it. You're now accountable for truth. Now, we want to become indifferent. We want to say, well, that doesn't really apply to me. It's not really talking to me. Or maybe I didn't hear God right. You know, sometimes, when, I would say most of the time, when you start a phrase like that, maybe I really didn't hear. That should remind you of one person. Who should that remind you of? Anybody? The devil. Because in the book of Genesis, when he came to tempt Eve, his first phrase to her was, did God really say that you shouldn't eat of this tree. Now, did you, now, maybe you misunderstood God. Maybe it wasn't true. Maybe, maybe you need to go back and re-examine that. Do you know Oswald Chambers? He's one of my favorite authors. You, you'll hear me quote him quite a bit because uh, he's helped me so much. I've been reading my utmost for his highest, and I've, I've bought all of his books. Matter of fact, I have one giant book that has everything he ever wrote in it. But he said, do you know that there is a time when prayer is a sin? And I went, what? I've never heard that before. And he went on to explain is when God has spoken and told you what to do and you want to linger praying over it, you're lingering in sin. God has spoken. Obey. Go do what he said. It ain't time to pray anymore. God has spoken. Time to obey. So anyway, going back to Asa, he listened to the word of the prophet and he gained courage from it. And this is what he did. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Now I want you to notice, first of all, that, that he finished what he started. In the, in the chapter 14, he began removing the foreign altars. He, re began, he began removing the high places. And here he went all the way. He, re he removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin. He cleaned them out. He was getting rid of false pagan worship throughout all of Judah. It reminds us that half-hearted obedience is not enough. Half obedience is still disobedience. He went the whole way. He, he took care of everything that was keeping Judah from worshiping the one true God. He took them away. Also notice that, that even though the scripture does not describe a battle between Israel and Judah, obviously there was one that was going on, an ongoing skirmish, because he had taken, he captured town or in the hills of Ephraim. Well, Ephraim is a part of Israel. It's not in the Judah territory when they divided. And so obviously there were some skirmishes going on and that's going to be important in a, in a few minutes. So just keep that in the back of your mind. It says there, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Probably a better word to use right there than the NIV uses, it would be he renewed the altar of the Lord. There's, there's no indication that the altar was broken down. A better indication was that they had been offering sacrifices to idols on the Lord's altar. They began to bring detestable practices into the house of God and on God's altar. They, they sacrificed to false gods. So a better, better idea here is he began to renew or cleanse whatever the process was for them to cleanse the altar so that it could be used for the sacrifices to Jehovah God again. That's what he's referring to. So he began, notice the, the process. He, they sought the Lord. He has sought the Lord. 
And we're going to see them do that more again. And then he begins to take away everything that's going to hinder them from worship of the true Jehovah God. And then they begin to repair the altar of the Lord so they could worship God. Now, just follow along with me here. He's doing everything he knows to do in the eyes of God that's right. He's begun by rebuilding the cities. He's gotten rid of the high places, the foreign altars. Now he's gotten rid of the detestable idols. They've gone into a major battle and he raised his hands and surrendered himself to God and said, God, if you don't win, if you don't fight, we don't win. Look at how God is using Asa to bring revival to the nation of Judah. What wonderful things. And he repaired the altar so they could worship. So he's done everything he knows to do. Now I want you to look at this. And I made that, those points because I want you to see this next verse. Because when I read this verse, I got excited. He said there, then he called all the people together. He assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon. Now Ephraim, obviously he had captured. But Manasseh and Simeon are from Israel. Those tribes are in the nation, are a part of the nation of Israel. And it says that they had settled among them for large numbers had come over to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. Amen. I'm going to tell you that excited me. You talk about a church growth program right there. Let, be, let it be known that the Lord God is in this place and he is moving among his people in this house. And when his people go out from this place, it is known abroad. What was it they said about the disciples? They took note that they had been with Jesus. And I'm telling you, people start taking note that you've been with Jesus. They start taking note that God is showing up in this place. They'll come just to watch the fire burn. Amen. That's why it's important that we get on fire for a holy God and surrender our life to him and seek after him because people will come just to see what God is doing in this place. We seek him wholeheartedly. We turn to him. We beg God, Lord, come and inhabit the praise of your people. And it says they showed up just because God, they, it was noise abroad. The Lord God was with him. Because the Bible says when you seek him, he'll be found. That he is with you when you're with him. When we're obedient to God, when we're seeking the power of God, recognizing that none of us in this room are capable of doing what only God can do. Then when God starts moving, it'll get noise abroad. People show up, just what is going on down there? I want to find out. And I'm going to tell you, that excites me right there. That ought to encourage us to seek the Lord, walk with him, know him, pray and seek his face. And then let's come in here on Sunday and Wednesdays and let God do whatever he wants to do so that this noise abroad, hey, something's going on down there at First Baptist Church. God's in the house down there at First Baptist Church. And even, I'm telling you, lost people may not know and understand spiritual things, but when they see it in you, they come to find out what's, what's going on. What, the, what do they have that I don't have? You know why people, I, I said this Wednesday night, you know why people don't want what you got? Because what you got looks like it hurts. And I'm going to tell you something, being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I'm telling you, I have met some dried up, pruned face, sucking on lemon looking Christians that did not make me want to have what they've got. It did not cause me to say, hey, what's different about you? Although I didn't want to ask that question, but it wasn't for the positive reason. What is your problem? My goodness. I may have mentioned to this to you before, but the little church I pastored in Cave in Rock, Illinois. <laughs> you ever heard of that before? Cave in Rock, Illinois. What you do is you go back and watch the old 50s uh, How the West Was Won with James Stewart. They get off a boat and go into a cave. Cave in Rock, Illinois. It's exactly where it's at. And every Sunday morning, I had this one gentleman that, he was an older gentleman, and, and he really wasn't very happy. And every Sunday, I would be at the front door greeting people coming into the building, and I, I would say, good morning. And his response every Sunday was, what's good about it? Boy, that'll set you on fire, won't it? That'll make you happy you in God's house. 
<laughs> and for several weeks, I took it. I'm thinking, well, bless this. You know, you don't want to offend somebody who's already upset because <laughs> he's touchy. <laughs> he's just a little touchy. But one day I'd had all I could take of that because that is just not a good way to come into God's house. And so he come to the service and I, he, I said, good morning, brother. He said, what's good about it? I said, bless God, you're awake, aren't you? You're breathing air. You're coming into the house of God to worship in freedom. Jesus is on the throne. There's plenty to be happy about. I'm saved and going to heaven, and I'm happy, and I know it. Amen. My goodness, there's something to rejoice over this morning, this evening. He called the people together, and I just love that scripture. Many, large numbers. You see that? It didn't say a few. He said, large numbers had come over to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord, his God, was with him. And you know why God was with him? Because he was with God. When God steps out into a direction and we as a church follow him, step by step, we're with him, he's with us. People will come just to see what's going on. But the moment God takes a step and we say, no, 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 we want to do it our way, we'll start losing that. And I'm going to tell you, I have made up my mind in my heart. I want what God wants. Whatever direction he goes, I want to follow him. And there are days I don't like it. I'm just going to be honest with you. There are things that God does. I'm going, God, I don't know why you're doing that. I don't like it. But as I said this morning, he don't care. Your opinion and your emotions are not top on his priority list. Otherwise, he'd have called you. He said, I just need to know this is what I'm thinking about doing. What you think? <laughs> God hadn't done that to me yet. All right, then notice, let's, let's move on. In verse 10, it says, They assembled at Jerusalem in the third month at the 15th year of Asa's reign. At that time, they sacrificed to the Lord Look at this, 700 head of cattle, 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder that they had brought back. Now I want you to notice the assembly's sacrifice. He calls this assembly together. Look at the sacrifice. We're talk, we've been talking today about seeking God in worship. And the first thing they did was they were willing to sacrifice. They were willing to give to God the extra. They had gone into the battlefield. This is what they brought back. 700 head of cattle, 7,000 sheep and goats. And I'm going to tell you, back in those days, that meant they were rich. If they had a lot of children and a lot of livestock, they were wealthy. But they didn't keep it. They didn't hoard it to themselves. And they didn't say, now God, you gave, why do we have to give this back? They sacrificed it all. They gave it back to God. I'm gonna tell you something. God gives us things for a reason. And there are times we just give it back. Lord, I lay it back at your feet. You do with it whatever you want. They sacrificed. As they began to worship, one of the first things they did was they, they sacrificed. The Bible talks about that in God's house, we give him a sacrifice of praise. Those are our sacrifices now. Because there are Sundays, I, I know this for a fact because I watch you and I'm, a, I'm an observer of people. I've been doing it for a long time. I watch people. And for some of you, it's a sacrifice every Sunday morning to praise. I'm looking. I mean, I've been watching. Some of you are sacrificing greatly, and your face shows it. Now, we did mention in choir one night that some of them are having trouble with their sacrifice of praise, too, because their face was showing it as well. But, but I don't want people to look at me and say, oh, bless his heart. We talked about that this morning, too. Bless his heart. I hope it gets better. <laughs> I'm going to be praying for him. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to pray for him. I hope it gets better. But they sacrificed. When they came to worship, when they assembled themselves together in the sight of God, they sacrificed. They gave up the abundance that God had given to them in battle. They gave it back to him. So the first thing they did in worship was they sacrificed. And then it said in verse 12, and I just love this. Matter of fact, the bylaws committee, some of y'all here, Still, because we, we really want to add this into our bylaws this year, I think would be a great idea. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and soul. 
All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were to be put to death, <laughs> whether small or great, man or woman. Anybody want to sign up for that one? We, we get a big poster board up here and says, I'm willing that if I don't seek God, y'all can kill me. <laughs> no. Oh, we don't want to do that. But I'll tell you what, that reminded me of how serious they were. That they did not take their commitment to the Lord lightly. Because you know what? It goes back to Deuteronomy. The law of God basically said if they don't follow the law of God, they die. They're put to death. And that's how serious they were. So they went back to their fundamentals. They emptied themselves of all their foreign idols, all the things that hindered their relationship with God. They sacrificed, they worshiped, they cleaned the altar up, they began to sacrifice to God. And then they made a covenant with God. You see, we're big on commitments. We like to make commitments. But I'm gonna tell you the greatest commitment you can ever make between you and God that says, Lord, I'm gonna seek you. I'm gonna follow wholeheartedly after you. Whatever you say, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna be obedient. I'm gonna tell you, if we did that, we wouldn't have to worry about getting you to commit to come to, to, uh, to visitation. We wouldn't have to worry about getting you to commit to be a worker in VBS because you've said to the Lord, I'm going to do whatever you tell me. And the Bible says that if, you, if we're lacking workers to pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he send in laborers into the field. They made a commitment to God. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord. And as I mentioned this morning, seeking is all about laying my opinions aside Laying my desires aside, laying my will aside and saying, God, I want to know your heart. You tell me what you're thinking. Point me in the direction you want me to go. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. Seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart, with all their soul. Verse 14 says, they took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and with horns. You know what, that, what that's saying to me? Is they made it known abroad. We are committing ourselves to seek God. We're committing ourselves to look for him with all of our heart and all of our soul. But see, we want to make private commitments. We want to be able to come down here and say, I, I've prayed today and, you know, when we, it's real quiet. We don't want to. Because, you see, when we tell people, we're accountable. People are going to be watching now. Oh, she said she was committing her life to Christ. She was going to be sold out. She wasn't turning back. What's she doing now? You see, we don't want a noise at a brawl, but they did. Boy, they shouted it loud. They blowed the horns. They, they shouted acclamations. We are going to seek God with all of our heart and all of our soul. We're taking an oath. You see, we don't want to do that because then we're held accountable to each other. But you know what, I, I'm coming, I'm not going to say I'm there, I'm coming to enjoy the accountability of somebody saying, hey, didn't you say that you were going to do that? You see, when Sandy and I first married, I didn't like it when she reminded me of what I said. I think it's a terrible thing for a person to use your own words against you. <laughs> and there are still, I'm not going to say that every time it happens that I love it. But I'm gonna tell you this, on the other side of it, I always appreciate it. That somebody loved me enough to say, hey, you said you were gonna do this. And if you're gonna be a good example for your kids, but more than that, if you're gonna keep the oath you have made to God, then you need to do what you said you'd do. And I think it's time that we as a people shout loudly and make loud acclamations to God, we're going to seek you. Making an oath, not to each other, not to me, not to you, but to God. And we let each other hold each, we hold each other accountable. Oh, not to be ugly, but to say, hey, you said he's going to seek God. And I'm going to tell you something. While we will, could not and would not physically put somebody to death, when you make that kind of oath to God, I'm going to seek you, and you quit seeking God, the Bible says, if you forsake me, that's what he said in the first part of chapter 15, if you forsake me, I will forsake you. That's spiritual death to me. There have been times in my life as a Christian that I have walked away from the very presence of God as far as God, I'm walking in obedience, and then I decide to walk in disobedience, and I'm going my own way. It's a slow death. 
Oh, I can't lose my salvation. I get to go to heaven when I die. But I'm going to tell you something. Heaven is far away. My relationship with Jesus is right here. It's right in my heart. Now, granted, heaven could be a breath away. But I can tell you what I know I have is my relationship with Christ. And there have been mornings when I have sat down at my desk and begin to pray and to study and seek the Lord. And I will realize immediately it's not the same. There's a problem. My communication with God is not what it was yesterday. Something's wrong. And sometimes it's because the devil don't want me to spend time with God and I had to fight through my emotions and fight through my uh, spiritual warfare to say, you know what? No, I'm not getting up from here. Bless God. I'm going to have a devotion. I'm going to pray. The devil ain't going to keep me from being in touch with God. But there are times it happens because I've done something wrong. I've got something in me and the Holy Spirit won't let me get into my normal communication and my normal study because he's saying, hey, there's a problem. And on that particular morning, I'm thinking of just, just one recently where I was getting ready to, to study and to pray and I just could not sense the Lord moving in me like I have since. And I stopped and said, what's wrong? What's the problem? Oh, and I'm gonna tell you, it didn't take God long. He told me exactly what the problem was. If you want to, you know, you ever met those people that if you don't want to know something, don't ask them? I'm going to tell you, God's that way. If you don't know, want to know what's wrong with you, I wouldn't ask him. But I'm going to tell you, the only way you're going to get better is ask him. And when I asked him, he showed me. And I repented. And suddenly my Bible study was great. <laughs> Prayer time was good. They sought the Lord. They took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and horns. We will Seek God with all our heart. And then look at what they did. They, they made this loud acclamation. And then the next verse, verse 15, all Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They were rejoicing. We have wholeheartedly sought after the Lord. We've made a covenant with God. We've made an oath with God that we're going to seek him. And we're happy about it. And then I love this. They sought God eagerly. And he was found by them. Amen. <laughs> they sought him and he was found. It's, the, it's a direct revelation, a direct uh, promise from verse 2. If you seek him, he will be found by you. And in verse 15, it says they sought him and he was found by them. He said it. He made a promise. And then you see it fulfilled in verse 15, they sought him eagerly and he was found. One other thing that I want to cover about Asa and how he, he removed the idols. He took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. I want you to notice also that he showed no favoritism in his obedience. If you look at verse 16, it says that King Asa also deposed his grandmother. Now, King James has probably said mother because the Hebrew word for mother and grandmother is basically the same word. But history tells us his, his grandmother's name was, I'm going to say her name was Miaka. I'm not sure if that's exactly how you say it, but that's how I'm going to say it because she's not here to defend herself. But he deposed her from, from, uh, from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive Asherah pole. He cut the pole down, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Kidron Valley was, was kind of like a refuse dump, a, gar a garbage dump. And he took it down to the Kidron Valley and burned it. And he removed her from her position. He didn't show favoritism. He didn't, just because somebody was close to him, he still did the right thing. And I appreciate that about it. That's a great example for us. That right is right. It doesn't matter who you're talking to. Right is right. Now, I love this. We, we see kind of the, as we wrap up, we see in verse 17, we see kind of a, a wrap up of Asa's life. He, although he did not remove the high places from Israel. Now, it says there in the previous chapter that he removed the high places from all of Judah but the towns that he had captured, most likely is what it's referring to, the towns he had captured in Israel, he did not remove them. He, left, he did leave a few things undone. But it says, other than that, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord 
all his life. He brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. And then look at this, verse 19, there was no more war. Until the 35th year of Asa's reign, there was no more war. God gave them rest because they sought him, they worshiped him, they sacrificed to him, they made a covenant with him that they would seek him wholeheartedly. And God rewarded them. Matter of fact, it says over there, but as for you, be strong, do not give up for your work will be rewarded. And God blessed him with peace. God rewarded his work. He blessed him with peace. Now, next week, or I'm sorry, not Sunday, we're gonna, we'll preach on Easter, on Easter Sunday. But the next week, we're gonna finish up the, the last years of Asa's life. I've told you before, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Asa, sad, it is sad, Asa did not finish well. He made some pretty bad mistakes in his final years. And it's, but it's a great lesson to us to remember that God, all through God blessing, God giving victory, you cannot let your guard down. You cannot stop seeking. The moment you start seeking, you start sinking. Peter kept walking on the water until he took his eyes off Jesus. And when he took his eyes off of him, he fell. But I want you to know, I want you to leave here tonight remembering that large numbers of people came from Israel when they saw that the Lord God was with them. Let somebody see that God's with you this week. Let your light so shine before men that they may glorify your Father in heaven for your good works. Amen. Let's stand together. It's been good to be in God's house today. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to tell you.